Um, hello, everybody, and welcome again to our Saturday lectures. And today it is my privilege to welcome Prabhajika Vrajaprana, who is a nun at the Vedanta Society of Southern California's Sarada Convent. She is a highly respected writer on Vedanta and the history and growth of the Vedanta societies. A sampling from her many works would include My Faithful Goodwin, Calcutta Advaita Ashrama, 1994, a biography of J.J. Goodwin, disciple of Swami Vivekananda. Living Wisdom, Vedanta in the West, Hollywood Vedanta Press, 1994, a portrait of, Christ of Sister Christine, Calcutta Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, 1996. Vedanta, A Simple Introduction, Hollywood Vedanta Press, 1999, and Interpreting Ramakrishna, Carla's Child Revisited, co-authored with Swami Tayagananda, MLBD Publishers, Delhi, 2010. Prabhujika Vrajaprana was born in California. She graduated from the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she also worked briefly as associate professor of literature. She came in contact with revered Swami Prabhavananda at the Vedanta Society of Santa Barbara in 1967, whilst involved with the anti-Vietnam War movement. In 1977, she joined the Sarada convent of the Vedanta Society at Santa Barbara and took the first vows of Brahmacharya in 1983 and her final vows of Sannyasa in 1988. As a renowned scholar on Hinduism, she is a very popular speaker and has given talks at several universities and interfaith gatherings. For example, Mataji was the Hindu representative at both the Dalai Lama's 2006 Gathering of Hearts Illuminating Compassion Conference, as well as the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu's 2008 Seeds of Compassion Conference. She was a panelist in the discussion on interpreting Ramakrishna at the Dharma Academy of North America held at the annual American Academy of Religion meeting in 2010. And she also proved to be a very popular panelist at our own interfaith conference in 2017. Her talk today will be Why Sarada Devi Matters. Mataji, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Diane. Thank you for inviting me and what a pleasure to see you all. I'm, I wish it were in person, but just seeing your faces here just makes me so happy. It makes me realize that we will get through this. We're gonna get back to normal. So with the help of Holy Mother, here we go. Om Sarva Mangala Mangalye Shive Savarta Sarike Sharane Trambake Gori Narayani Namostute Jaya Narayana most to te, Jaya Narayana most to te, Jaya Narayana most to te. O you who are the giver of all blessings, O you who are the doer of all good, O you who are the fulfiller of all desires, O you who are the giver of refuge, our salutations to you, our salutations to you, our salutations to you again and again. Again, good afternoon. Good evening from here in way too sunny Santa Barbara. You know, Holy Mother was in Jairambati and once a, a elderly low caste you know, labor came out and she had gone to her place to deliver some goods that had been sent from a, a disciple in another village. And this woman, by the time she arrived was hot and tired and exhausted. So mother told her, please, you know, don't just go back immediately. You stay, you bathe, you rest, give her some food before you go back to the village. But the old woman was exhausted. And so the mother said, no, no, no. Don't try to go back this afternoon. Spend the night, spend the night here and you can go back tomorrow morning. So this elderly woman spent the night on the veranda right outside mother's bedroom where it was cool and she slept well. And mother, when she rose early in the morning she always did really early, she noticed that this elderly woman had soiled herself on the floor because not only was she elderly, she also had malaria, she was sick. 
So mother realized that if someone else discovered what had happened, all holy hell would break loose and there'd be a scene. So mother herself cleaned up, cleaned up everything and got the woman said, you know, it's, it's going to be very hot today. So she got her some puffed rice and she got her molasses and gave it to her so she could carry with her. She said, please leave now where it's nice and cool and that way you'll have a comfortable journey. And the woman happily went off on her own. Now, the only reason we even know about this is that someone discovered that, that they went into, it's like, who cleaned the veranda so early? Who did it? What, what happened? So they went to mother, do you know who cleaned this? And mother had to explain what happened. That's the only reason we even know about this. So mother was just took care of it very ordinarily. And what's quite extraordinary about this is how totally ordinary Holy Mother's thought this was. Because we have to remember that um, this woman was of a low caste. We have to remember that this woman also, it's like they didn't have any handy wipes. They didn't have any of those sanitizing gloves. So mother was, was cleaning this up with her own hands with a piece of her own sorry that she'd torn off. But, and it's not extraordinary. If you're dealing with your own child, then it's not extraordinary. If you're dealing with somebody else, yeah, it's like, whoa. But Holy Mother dealt with this woman as if it was her own child. How many people do we know that say, I could never, I could never change a diaper. But then when they have their own baby, when they have their own child, everything changes. Then changing that diaper and cleaning that baby's little bottom becomes a tender act of love. It's a very tender, sweet act of pure love. And that's how Holy Mother treated this elderly, low caste woman. Now, we in the West have absolutely no concept of caste. It doesn't, it doesn't compute. We don't get it, but we sure understand money and we understand class. So maybe the correlation here would be, let's say this woman was not a low caste woman, but maybe a homeless woman. Maybe she didn't smell so good. Maybe she was one of those throwaway people that we tend to ignore when we see on the street. She, unwanted and uncared for. How many of us would take our hands without a handy wipe, clean up after them, not even think it was any big deal? How many of us would really think I'm cleaning up after my baby. But that was what was so extraordinary about Holy Mother because she literally saw this woman as her own child, as are we all, as is everybody. High caste, low class, black, white, brown, yellow, green, in between spotted and striped, old person, young person, sane, crazy, Republican, Democrat, Householder, monastic, householder, or homeless, or all her children. And that's why Holy Mother matters, because we are all her children, but more, just as importantly, so is everybody else. So is everybody else. Humans, non, non humans, all beings are her children, whether we know it or not, whether we understand it or not. And just that fact alone is why. Holy Mother started dating matters. And if there was ever a time that we needed to really think about Holy Mother started dating and why she matters, it's actually now, especially now when everything is so strange and so weird and just so difficult to deal with. And that's why I decided I really want to speak about Holy Mother she started dating today, because there's actually so much that we can learn from her life and from her teachings that are so applicable to our lives today, completely and totally applicable. And the other thing is that I think we tend to sentimentalize mother. We tend to put her in this little box of, oh, she's so loving and she's so compassionate, which is true. But then we tend to leave it at that. And we tend to kind of wrap her in gauze instead of really think of everything that she was. If we do just consign her to that, it just, wrap her like that. We neglect her power and her strength and her really amazing intelligence. And we ne neglect all the other parts of mother and her teachings. 
And she gives us these life lessons that really that we can use right now and we can learn from them. We all know what she said at the end of her life. My child, if you wish to find peace of mind, don't see the faults of others, rather see your own. No one is a stranger. The whole world is your own. We all know that. We all probably memorized it a long time ago. And that is extremely significant. And we're going to come to it later. But our Holy Mother was the Divine Mother herself. She wasn't just an ordinary woman, though she pretended to be. Sri Ramakrishna said, she is Sarda, Saraswati. She is born to bestow knowledge on others. She's born to do that. If that's the case, if that's so, we should make a point of trying to learn what she has to teach us, not just sentimentalize her and, and put her in a little safe box where, where nothing will disturb her. Because mother knew exactly who she was. You know, in Jairamati, she had to deal with her totally insane family. I mean, insane is, is, is just a point of fact. It's like those people were just plain nuts. On top of that, they were greedy. They were avaricious. They were incredibly unkind and just like were at her all the time. They were arguing with each other, arguing with her. Just so, you know, like the family from hell is what she had. And it's a good learning lesson from us. Because if she can deal with a family from hell, anyone else can deal with a family from hell because she gives us lessons on how to deal with it, let alone a kind of normal dysfunctional family that everyone seems to have. It's like they know how to, her life itself teaches us how to live our own lives. So one day it got so bad, you know, Radu, she was, Radu was so incapacitated and she was a full-fledged adult that mother had to feed her by hand and then mother would spit the food out right on her. It's like, and then she had the, the relatives at her and at her and finally mother got so fed up that she said, look here, do not trouble me too much. If the one who is within me once raises his hood like a cobra, there is none among you, none among Brahma, Vishnu or Shiva that can save you. You can imagine that kind of made them pause and take a breath. It's like, okay, all right, well, we won't, okay, thank you. Of course, mother, of course, mother, but that, that, that stopped him right there. She knew who she was, but she lived among us. She lived like one of us. So we could feel no awe, no mystery, no sense of separation, no, no, no hesitancy. That way we could open up our hearts to her and talk to her like we talk to our own because she is our own without fear. You know, wouldn't all of you agree with me in saying this has been a lousy year? Thumbs up, lousy year. Yeah, full scale on lousy year. 2020, two thumbs down, bad year. And things are definitely getting better, but we're still not out of the woods yet. We're still in the midst of COVID. We still have to deal with the lockdowns. We still have to deal with people being sick, people dying. And then there's economic worries and people are losing jobs. And there's the political complete insanity that's going on. And it's going to take a while before this, this new normal, whatever that may be, becomes established. And things are, are better for sure. But at the same time, everything seems kind of tenuous. We're, we're kind of afraid like the bottom we're going to drop if something else goes wrong. I mean, who would have expected a, a potential coup in January? Who would have expected Texas not to have <laughs> electricity? heat oh come on texas what's 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 going to happen now locusts boils and you know here in santa barbara after our fires and the mudslides we know like not only is anything possible it's probable you don't think it'll happen you know it can happen so with all that's going on right now and this kind of underlying fear in this trepidation about oh my god what's going to happen next we need guidance on how to get through it all. I mean, not just from the crumbs that are left on the world table. You know, oh, what crumbs can I get to get through this time? But we need some real spiritual guidance on how to live our lives, how to live our spiritual life in the world, how to get through the day. That's what we need. And that's when we go to mother because she's extremely re relevant in the present and in the future because she's not just for turning turning to when our chips are down. It's like, oh, mother, please help me now. Get me out of this. She's there for us all the time, 
all the time. She's not only our mother, she's our spiritual guide. She's our friend. She's our protector. She's our higher power. She's our patronus. She's our, our wisdom and our strength. She's our voice of reason and compassion and our, and our deepest inner strength when we are in times of struggle and boredom and stress and despair and depression. She's there all the time for us, waiting for us to go to her. She's our all the time go-to being available at all times. So what would mother tell us now? Now, she'd say, keep your mind on God. She said, whatever you're doing, keep your mind on God. She said, don't lose sight. Always remember Takor. Always remember Takor. You know, there's so much static electricity going on now in this country and around the world. There's political and social upheavals and there's arguments and people are trying to tell us there's no COVID or people not wearing masks. And it's really hard to ignore them. And it's really hard not to get pulled into that vortex of anger and to get into a controversy, even though it robs us of our peace. We can't do that. So in mother's time itself, there was plenty of controversy and there was plenty of controversy over social customs. But this is what mother said. She said, don't let your mind be disturbed over these trivial details. She said, that will make you forget the master. She said, whatever people may say, remember the master and do what you consider to be right. That's such a great rule of thumb because otherwise people are always gonna to try to drag us in to their, to their vortex, their strong opinions, their anger, their hate, their, their fear. We can't do that. Go to mother, pray to Takwa. We have to keep our eyes on the prize, not lose sight of the ultimate goal of life, which is freedom, absolute freedom. Mother would also tell us that if we want a genuine spiritual life, don't neglect your work, don't neglect your duties, don't neglect your daily activities, because that's what mother did all the time. It's essential to work, and she said, it's through work alone that we can break the bonds of karma. Only then could we be free from desire. She said, one shouldn't be without work even for a single moment. Now, when she says that, she's not being all American about it. You know how Americans have this kind of obsessive need to be busy all the time, even though it's not important, but it's like, oh, I can't do it. I'm just too busy. I'm just too stressed. I'm too busy. It's like, unless an American feels busy, it's like they have no exist reason to be on the planet. So we have this obsessive need to feel important by just being busy, even if it's being doing stupid things, like you know, looking on Twitter or whatever. But it's like, I'm busy. But with mother, it's like, no, not busy for the sake of being busy, not being useless. She said, you have to do this kind of practical, concentrated work and do it with your whole mind in practical concentration all the time. Because she said, you can't meditate all the time because people said, oh, mother, I just want to meditate. No, she said, even the monks, you cannot meditate all the time. Do the work, do the surface work of the master. She said, everyone has to do some kind of work, no matter who they are. So work as an offering to the Lord, as an offering to the divine. Now, people often think, you know, if I wasn't so busy, if I had more time, then I'd have time for a real spiritual life. Then I could meditate and I could study, but now I'm so busy. I don't have time for a real spiritual life. When I retire, when I get some time, then, you know, then I'm going to really work on my spiritual life. But mother emphasized exactly the opposite. She said she emphasized the necessity and the real value of work. Concentrates the mind. Mother showed us in her own life that the highest realization comes from doing our work, our daily activities, because it's all in the mind and it's all in the attitude that we bring to whatever we do, whether it's our actions or our meditation, it's all the attitude in our own minds. That's what we have to deal with. You know, once there was a young monk in Chayamati and he had finished, he was sweeping the, the, her, her little cottage there and they just kind of threw the broom in a corner. And mother noticed it and she said, how strange, my dear. 
the work is finished and you throw it away carelessly, it takes almost the same amount of time as to put it away carefully as to just throw it. She said, should you despise a thing because it's insignificant? She said, won't you need it again? She said, this is so fantastic. She said, besides this thing too forms a part of this household. It deserves some consideration. You must give each his, dear, his, his, his due share of honor. She said, each, even a broom must be shown some honor. The smallest work must be done with reverence. It's like even a broom has a place in her heart. We tend to separate, oh, that's just a thing. No, everything is due honor and respect. And if, imagine if she thinks of that way about a broom, imagine how she thinks about us. Imagine how tenderly she holds us in her heart. Mother teaches us that each and every work that we do, whether it's a chore or some highly important job, to do it with equal attention, equal reverence, because and deserving of equal care and respect. And that in itself teaches us a lot. It's the attitude of a perfect karma yogi. And once a woman came from Kolkata to Jairamati because she wanted to get some spiritual instruction from mother. Her mother was really busy. I mean, she was cooking, she was cleaning out the pots and pans, she was serving all the activities, in comes her family, oh my God. Everything, her disciples are here, people are coming in, going out. She's cleaning up, she's serving more people. And she's, she's busy the whole time. And finally, the woman says to her mother, I came, to get, I came here to get some spiritual instruction, but it seems to me that you're too busy even to speak to me. And the mother told her, she said, have I not been giving you spiritual instruction? Ooh, it's like, don't you glad you're not that woman? It's like, oh God, she said it out loud. <laughs> what else would mother tell us to do now? She'd say, keep meditating and keep doing your job. Don't give up and keep a routine. A disciple told her, mother, I can't concentrate my mind well during meditation. My mind wanders, it's fickle and unsteady. That's, oh, isn't that a big surprise? Oh, how come he, he can't meditate? I can meditate. That's right. It's a big, it's everybody's problem, right? She said, don't worry. Restlessness is in the nature of the mind because it has to deal with eyes and ears. It's nature's to go out. She said, this is so important. She said, the name of God is more powerful than the senses. And I think that's really important for us to remember when we get frustrated and think, oh my God, look where my mind's going. It's like, the name of God is more important than the senses that try to drag us out. We have to remember, I have the holy mantra. It is one, absolutely one with, with God, absolutely one with my chosen ideal. And that's much more important than my lunatic, puny little senses. It gives us a lot of strength to remember that. She said, always think of the master who is looking after you. She said, don't be troubled about your lapses. I think that's a really good message for us too, because otherwise it's easy for us to think, oh, I can't do it. Why should I bother now? I haven't been able to do it before. Why am I going to be able to be more successful now? It's like, no, don't be troubled. Start again. Every day is a new day. Swami Prabhavananda used to say, every day think, today is the day that I shall realize God. Every day. Every day, because one day it shall happen. To be like Shabri. Today is the day when Rama will come. Every day, today is the day that I shall realize God. So mother tells us to keep a fixed, regular schedule from, for, for meditation and for java and keep to it, keep to it. She said, you must sit down at least once in the morning and again in the evening. She said, it acts like a rudder on a boat. It keeps us steady, keeps us going. She said, when one sits to meditate in the evening, we get a chance to think of what we've done both good and bad. She said, during the whole day, we can think of, okay, yes, eh, not so good. And she said, then we can compare that state of mind to the previous day. She said, unless you meditate both morning and evening every day and do it along with your work, she said, she said how can you know what you're actually doing? 
Oh, such a good point. Because we tend, even in meditation, even in our work, to go on autopilot. We just create these ruts in our mind and we just sit down and do it. And we don't even know what we've been thinking about. But if we get into the habit of kind of reflecting on the day, the good points, the bad points, then we can kind of analyze where the weaknesses are. And then we can try to do something about it. But if we just go on autopilot, we'll just continue on autopilot. And that's not terribly helpful. We won't be able to, we won't be able to make progress because we're all trying to swim in this ocean of Brahman, right? But you know, there's the little sharks underneath, right? Da 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 the sharks are right there. And they're trying to pull us at the ankles. And if they pull us down at the ankles, they impede our progress. And often we're not even aware of those sharks below us. Now these sharks are pretty standard fare. Uh, anger, hatred, greed, lust, delusion, self-centeredness, all of the anger, frustration, depression, the usual suspects. But these sharks are down there looking for an opportunity. They're circling us. So we can analyze our mind and kind of analyze what the sharks are. And if we can kind of deal with analyzing it and, and kind of naming it, then the shark kind of says, oh, I'm gonna find another swimmer. You're getting on my nerves. We have to see what the obstacles are and then see what we can do to, to correct them. Then we have this devotee, and this one is like one of my total favorites. Okay, this devotee, we gotta love this person, says, comes to mother and says, mother, what's the secret? It's like, okay, can you give me one thing that I can do and I can remember? Please keep it simple. It's like mother is so accommodating. She, she has this great response, so quick on the drop. She turns around and in the corner, there's this clock ticking. Tick, 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 tick. And she said, as that clock is ticking, so go on repeating the name of God. Repeat God's name. She said, that will bring you everything. Nothing more need be done. Pingo, so simple, so clear. Tick, 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 tick. Repeat the name of the Lord. It's like make a delicious dinner by just adding water. It's like so simple, but the problem is actually doing it because the mind is so scattered and so restless and it flits about here and there and here and there and up and down that after a while we realize we're not really thinking about the mantra, but we're thinking about what we're going to have for dinner or what we have to do tomorrow or rehashing an argument or remembering a stupid song or, or we're just sliding into cat space. We have to keep our eyes on the prize again. Tick, tick, tick. Repeat the name of God, the mantra again and again and again and make it such a habit such a habit, such a habit that after a while, the name starts to repeat itself. It becomes automatic and that's what we want. So that means we have to watch because those sharks are out there wanting to be fed. We have to watch where the mind goes because even TV and movies can make a real impression on our minds. What to speak of holy or unholy company so we have to really watch if something is bringing down our mind, if something is making us lesser than who we are, if we are in the company of people that we realize, you know, I don't like that conversation. It's really not helpful to me right now. If we feel like it's making us, it's bringing our minds down instead of elevating our minds, we have to start stop hanging out with them and hanging out with people who are more in line with what we want out of our life. People who are bring our minds up, who make us more elevated, who make us think in terms of our higher nature, not our lower nature. So we have to be really conscious about whether we're feeding those sharks. Because if we're feeding the sharks, we're gonna bring more obstacles in our life. We got enough already. We don't need to add any more. We got enough. But one thing that mother would say said if we find problems in our mind don't try to blame others for our own lack of control of our own mind because she would say 
don't see the faults of others. We all know that mother literally couldn't see the faults of others and she told us to do the same. But she has a really good, good reason for, for telling us that because we end up developing the same faults ourselves as the ones we're criticizing in others. It's a really good point that she's making because if we see other people's faults, we ourselves develop them and then we become petty and small-minded. We don't want to become mere fault finders, those that dosha drishti, the Shrama Krishna Holy Mother had, because we don't want to become a mean-spirited, petty person, which is what we'd end up becoming. Mother said, human beings are bound to make mistakes. We, we tend to see them in other people. We're not quite so eager to see them in ourselves. She said, if one, she said, one should not notice others' fault. And she said, if, if one doesn't notice, it doesn't follow this rule of just not noticing their faults. She said, it harms oneself alone. It just hurts us. She said, by constantly observing the faults of others, in the end, one will become a mere fault finder. And the word she uses here is dushika chok, infected eyes, dushika chok. It's like, so what happens, like our, our vision, our perception becomes sick, infected, distorted, like looking at people through a funhouse mirror. Our ability to see things correctly becomes ill. We don't want to be surrounded by petty, small-minded people, and we sure don't want to become that ourselves. No one wants to be that person. Because it's such a sad state to be in. Here we are, the infinite. All power and all purity and all joy is within our hearts. But to neglect that and waste our energy and, you know, just picking and picking and picking at others, it just increases our negativity and our pettiness. And we end up developing the same faults because we've developed a samskara, a nice little rut in our minds. So we ourselves are going to have that rut and we're going to fall into that rut ourselves. Yes. So mother was being extremely practical and psychologically astute in talking about this. She said, whenever people discuss good or evil, let's say we're in a room and someone comes in discussing good or evil. She said, all those who are present in that room take a little share of that good or evil. It's like, ew, never thought about that. She said, suppose someone tells you about his good or evil deeds. Every time you think of that person, every time you see that person, you will think of both the good or the evil deeds that that person has told you about. She said, in this manner, both the good deeds and the evil deeds leave an impression on your mind. It's like, you, I never thought of that. But it's true, isn't it? It's true. We have to be really, for that reason, we have to be really careful of the company we keep. Even our own company, if we find ourselves doing that, kill it, stop it, stop it, stop it before it spreads. That's why mother said it's so important to be careful. She repeatedly says one must be so careful. She said every action has its effect. So we need every part of our mind, every avenue of our mind going towards freedom, going towards illumination. We don't want to create more obstacles for ourselves because, we'll, hey, you know what? We got enough already, okay? You know, people often say, they ask us, they talk to each other, why are we suffering so much? Or why do the innocent suffer? You now, we all feel pain when we see the sufferings of other people. And we often ask, how does God permit this to go on? How does God permit the innocent to suffer? And it's one of humanity's oldest and most vexing questions because it pains us. It literally pains us to see that. You know, in the Bible, we have Job and God and the devil get into this, you know, bargain. What is it like a, like a bet? It's like they have a bet. Okay, devil versus God. And so God visits him with, uh, or the devil, with, with, with uh, first of all, with boils and then with locusts. And then he kills all of his sons and then he kills all of his cattle. And then everything, it's like just to test Job's faith. You know, my childhood memory of that was like, 
you call that God? That God, I don't want to deal with that man. He's scary. Wow, tough guy. But then the more obvious data, data questions from our own experience with people. Why did God permit the Holocaust? Or look at the suffering of the Pandavas. They meant suffering of partition. Or the current ravages of COVID. Could God have stopped COVID for God? Come on, come on. You could do it. Why? Why does God permit it? Now, we expect mother, who was the most compassionate, the most sympathetic, to be here on our side. And Davis, you know, to be there and be sympathetic for us. But her response is not what we're really what we're expecting. She says, people complain about their griefs and their sorrows. And they pray to God, but they find no relief from pain. So we want her to say something that's going to relieve us from pain. She said, but grief itself is a gift from God. It's like, huh, really? Um, I haven't had that experience yet, but, but go on. Go on. <laughs> so far, so far, not so good. She said, she said, grief is a symbol of his compassion. Oh, thanks. She said, tell me, who is there in the world who has not had to bear sorrow? She said, Vrinda once said to Krishna, who said you are merciful? As Rama, you filled Sita's life with sorrow. And as, as Krishna, you filled Radha's heart with sorrow. It encompasses prison. Your parents wait for you day and night. Yet we call upon you because one who takes your name has no fear of death. Well, that's kind of the big one, isn't it? That's kind of the big prize. No fear of death. Fear of death. Most of us will say, I don't feel de fear death. I, I just don't want to suffer. I don't want to hurt. I don't want pain. The pain is kind of the warm up act. It's the warm up act for the big show, which is death. You don't get one without the other. You know, long ago, Swami Ashokananda wrote something and it stuck in my mind. Swami Ashokananda was the great Swami in San Francisco who was disciple of Swami Vivekananda received the mantra and the dream from him. And it was verified by Swami Shivananda. And he said, it's a kindness of the Lord to give illness and suffering to people in their last days. And I thought, man, that is cold. That is cold hearted. You know, great suffering. He said, because unless there's a period of suffering before people's death, people will still keep clinging to life. He said, it's like living in a house that you've lived in your whole life. It's like, and then someone says, okay, you've got to move. You're being evicted. You go, uh -uh, uh, 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 this is my house. I bought it. I've been in this house for 75 years. I was born in it. My parents were here. I've been married in it. My kids were here. I'm not leaving this house. It's part of me. It's who I am, my house. And he said, we will stay in that house unless the house is burning down or unless, you know, it starts to fall apart. You know, and when this house is burning down or starting to fall apart, then we can't get, we can't wait to get out of this house. And that's most of the time there is enough attachment to, to life that it will happen. Remember Swami Shraddhanada said, I'm 93 years old. I can't see, I can't hear, I can't taste. Everything hurts. And I go out for a little walk and I see a flower and I go, ah. Life is so sweet. He said there's this clinging to life. It's true. So when we, you know, this, this house here, when it gives us pleasure and joy, this house is really nice to inhabit. It's a good house. But when it gives us more sorrow than joy, more pain than pleasure, then eviction notice isn't such a bad thing. Otherwise, we're going to stay in this nice, comfy house. So mother says that grief is a gift from God. Why? Because grief reminds us how temporary this whole show is. It's a very short show. It's very temporary. It's over in a heartbeat. So mother also tells us to pray and to pray and to pray. Now we always think meditate, meditate, meditate. We're Hindus, Hindus and Buddhists, we meditate. We don't pray. That's for Christians and Muslims and you know whoever else, Jews. But Thakur Ma and a number of direct disciples 
emphasize prayer a great deal. It's hard to meditate. It's hard to concentrate our minds, but prayer naturally concentrates the mind because it gets the will involved and the will kind of directs the mind. It makes it more constant. It focuses the mind on a particular goal, on a particular need that we have. So it helps us concentrate on the goals that we desire. I'm not talking about prayer to win the lottery. That's a curse, but prayer for knowledge, for wisdom, pray for the Lord's grace, for discernment, for compassion, for sincerity. We, we, and mother repeatedly say, pray for God's grace, pray for Tucker's grace. She repeatedly said, and to pray for the Lord's grace and also praying for the welfare of others is a really good thing. First, first of all, it helps them. Second of all, just as much it helps us. It gives us more compassionate and enlarges our hearts. And it, it gives us, it gives us more unselfishness. We expand our being. Mother said, pray to God with tears in your eyes whenever you want illumination or find yourself faced with any doubt or difficulty. She said, the Lord will remove all your impurities. He will assuage your mental anguish and will give you enlightenment. That's, that's a pretty stiff promise there. All these things mother says that we shall have through prayer. And you don't argue with a divine mother herself because she knows more than we do. Now, what if we can't manage any real tears? Remember when I was like 15 and totally into Vedanta, it's like, I'm supposed to pray with tears in my eyes. So I sat down, it's like, how can I cry? How can I cry? It's like, damn, I'm working on this. I just can't do it. So it's like, I'm thinking my dog who died. It's like, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. <laughs> and they have to be real tears. So, you know, if we can't manage real tears, don't worry about it. It takes immense purity, immense sincerity to really have that purity, to be able to have sincere tears. Don't worry about it. So we can start with mother or Lord, please give me your grace. Please purify my heart. So at least I want to think about you. Can I please grab you sincerity? And give me strength. Give me endurance. We can bring out our spiritual wish list, you know, just like those, those lists that they have for marriage, you know, registries. We can bring our own spiritual list to the Lord. Say, this is what I want. Give, give it to me. You know, who else am I going to get? No one else is going to give it to me but you. Bring out the things. And the more we express what we really want in our spiritual life, the more we really will want it because it brings out our deepest sincerity, our love. It increases our love. Prayer is helpful too because we don't need to find that quiet corner that Shrema Krishna is always talking about, that moni boni kone, you know, to, we need a quiet place within the mind or in a forest or in a corner, a secluded corner somewhat. Some places, sometimes you don't get it, but prayer, we can do that in a car. We can do it at the dining table when people are, you know, just nattering about nothing. We can pray. We can sit in front of the TV and realize, I don't need to listen to that commercial. Let me talk to Shrama Krishna, Holy Mother, for a minute. Let me just let me just tune out of that and tune into this. We can do it anytime, anywhere. We can do it in the shower. We can do it jogging. It's just, it's it's an all-time easy thing. Just, and it puts us at ease and develops a relationship with our ishta, with our chosen ideal. We can just speak what our mind is. You say, look where my mind is going. I was watching this TV thing. God almighty, look where my mind went. Please, can you fix that? It, it, it allows us to have this easy, sweet relationship that is more easiest for us to go back to because we have to make the Lord our own, make God our own. Speak to the Lord, speak to the mother as we would to our nearest and dearest without shame or fear or hesitation like we would to our best friend without fear of, of them rolling their eyes at us. Mother said, one who makes a habit of prayer will easily overcome all difficulties and will remain calm and unruffled in the midst of the trials of life. Oh man, doesn't that sound perfect? Trials of life is what this whole last year has been about. Trials with a capital T. We've had trials. But she said, 
prayer will easily overcome all difficulties and we will be able to remain calm and unruffled. You know what? Sign me up for that. That's what I want. Sign me up. I'll sign it. And Mother says this come with making a habit of prayer, turning our mind to the Lord, just speaking, speaking, opening our hearts. And the more we remember the divine, the more we pray, the more we pray, the more we remember the divine. It becomes this lovely feedback loop. And speaking of feedback loop, the mother tells us God cannot be realized without love. She said, yes, sincere love. Okay. So the disciple asked this really obvious question. How does one get love for God? Because how do we love something or someone we don't know, have never met, haven't seen, have no experience of? Can't love a movie if you haven't seen it, right? It's like, I love that movie. I haven't seen it. It's like, oh, come on have to have some sort of experience. She said, mother said, the grace of God is the thing that is needful. She said, one should pray for the grace of God. Oh, okay, back to prayer again. Okay, if mother recommends it so much, might not be such a bad thing. She assures us it will work. She promises us it will work. And one mother again says, one who prays to God eagerly will see him. And I think that might be the crux of the problem because she uses the word eagerly. And most of us are kind of on the spectrum of lukewarm. It's like, oh Lord, please grant me enlightenment. Please grant me your vision. Okay. All right. Well, you know, then I'll be happy with a good meal, a nice family and a warm puppy. Nice view, cup of coffee. We're a little more insistent on our morning cup of coffee or morning cup of tea than that earnest, that eagerness to see God. We don't have that real intense yearning. And that's kind of our problem. So theoretically, we want the divine, but in a practical daily life, we tend to be pretty satisfied with everything going okay. It's going good. It's going good. Got a raise, good chant, fam, family, good coffee, good, good dog, good everything. It's like great view. Until something happens. It's like, oh mother, please help. We don't have the eagerness that mother says that we need to have. One who prays to God eagerly will see him. So how do we get back? How do we get that eagerness? Okay. Feedback loop. Pray. Okay, you say I have to be eager. I'm not so eager. Please give me that eagerness. Give me that sincerity. So, so that I can want what I really need in my life. Can you please, Mother, make that happen? Who else can do it but you? So what else would Mother tell us to do now? You know, considering what's going on in this country and around the world, she'd say, seek God and God alone. And at the same time, do your work and keep your mind centered on God. And practice compassion, practice compassion. Mother herself was the embodiment of compassion. She said, I do not know anyone, not even an insect for whom I do not feel compassion. Now we tend to have compassion for the people we love and not a lot of compassion for the people we don't love or disagree with or find them annoying or think they're a threat in some way but we need to have compassion. That doesn't mean we allow people to walk all over us because under the guise of being compassionate, we don't say anything because even though our hearts are like, Ugh, it's like, I don't say anything because I'm, I've got compassion for him. No, that's just weakness. We can't allow injustice to go on, even if the injustice is to us. Real compassion is seeing the divinity in all beings, whether they aggravate us or not, whether they agree with us or not, whether they're on the same side, whatever that might be, that we're on. As Swamiji said, from the lowest worm to the highest, the highest human being, the same divine nature is present. It's present everywhere. So when we try to see it in others and really work on seeing that divinity in others, then we can have a sense of what real compassion is. It's seeing the divinity first human being second. And whatever that compassion is, it's not sentimentality. It's not that warm and fuzzy hallmark card sort of, Neh. 
It's a real spiritual practice. It's a very practical application of Vedanta. So if we have a hard time dealing with people who are disagreeable, people who seem to be against everything we believe in, everything we care about, we have to step back and realize we can't change them, can't change their opinions. We can barely deal with ourselves, let alone anybody else. Pray for them, put them at the feet of the divine and then get off our high horse. Pray for them, move on. We can't change them. You know, I began this talk with the story of the, the elderly low caste woman who, and Holy Mother cleaning up after her with such tenderness and love. Mother did it quietly. She didn't think it all extraordinary because she literally saw this old woman as her own baby, as her own child. She saw that, you know, that oneness that we're always talking about in Vedanta literally suffused everything she said and everything she did. So when she says, my child, if you wish to find happiness, do not find faults with others, rather see your own faults. She said, no one is a stranger. The whole world is your own. That's just the highest truths of Adonis spoken in the most simple, natural, loving way. The oneness of existence means that literally no one is a stranger, can't be. And nothing and no one is separate from us. Even people we don't agree with. Even people that we think are trying to destroy those things that we love so much. They have every bit as much Atman as we do. It's like no one is bereft of Atman. Mother saw every being as her own child. Literally every being. Dogs and cats and cows and fish and birds. Every being was loved and, and tenderly cherished by her and protected by her compassion and her love. She could never see anybody as other, one of those people, because everybody was her dear child. So what about us, hey, what about us? If we could even try, try to see others as she did, seeing others as manifestations of divinity and just trying to see others as our children, as the mother or her father, tenderly takes care of their kids. I know you guys, you are your parents. The way that you take care and hold your children, the way you kiss the tops of their head, the way that everything that they do is so sweet to you, even when they're annoying. That sort of tenderness and care. If we could do that and just try to do that in our relationships with others, wouldn't our life be so much sweeter? If a few of us even tried to do that, make that our spiritual practice, not letting people walk over you, but just try to have that tenderness as we react to people, even mentally, instill that, then our life would be so sweet and our life would be a blessing to those around us. I'll conclude with the words of Swami Asheshananda. Holy Mother's great disciple who was in Portland for at least 50 years, a great sadhu. He would often say, Thakur is the method, Mother is the grace. Chananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagad Guru Padme Tayo Shritwa Panamami Mohur Mohu Panamami Mohur Mohu. I take refuge in Holy Mother Sri Sarda Devi and Sri Ramakrishna. Salutations to them again and again. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank you for allowing me to talk on one of my favorite subjects. I'll open up to questions if others have any questions. How to be tender and not allow people, mm, I couldn't see to walk all over you. You can be tender and not let people walk over you. You just let them know that you have your boundaries. And when they cross the boundaries, you firmly and kindly say, no, no. It's like, I'm a dog owner, right? You don't allow the dog to break the rules because otherwise you've got a monster on your hand. You don't allow children to behave like, like a pack animals and let them do whatever they like because then they become 
really annoying human beings. Everybody has to follow, everybody has to be able to show respect for one another. So if people aren't showing respect to other people, aren't showing respect to us, not as far as our big position, but just as simple human beings, kindly, respectfully, no, we don't go there. That's enough. We had a person come in the comment, I was, I was like, ah, he's one of those um, conspiracy guys, QAnon guys, uh, comes in without a mask, brings in, and he said, starts speaking very ill and improper words about our governor. And he's just spewing and spewing. I said, stop it. And he kept going. I said, Jim, stop it. Stop right now. No politics here. It's like he kind of wanted something to pour out the venom on. It's like, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. It's like, bye. Thank you for bringing some oranges. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Ciao, baby. You know, you just have to show your limits with respect. You don't, you don't deal with fire with fire. Kindly, carefully, but really clearly show them the boundary. Any other questions? Problems, arguments? Everyone's strong and healthy? Yay. I like that thumbs up, Bill. Good. Glad to see that. Question. Um, yes. One of the things that was striking to me in the Holy the Mother's life <clears throat> is that how she treated Amjad, the yes. Muslim worker. Uh, I grew up in Calcutta. And, and even in 1990s, my mother wouldn't do that. My own mother, she would not let a Muslim come into the house even come enter the house, uh, probably. And, uh, and it, 150 or 175 years ago, a village woman with no education can do that. That tells me that she's goddess. Isn't that amazing? I mean, absolutely amazing. It's like, because her village was so restricted and they were just, she could have been, you know, uncasted in a, in a minute but she couldn't stop her heart. She couldn't stop her heart. The fact that, and, and Swamiji, he, he was like ambulant, just overjoyed that mother ate with Nivedita and, and the American women. It's like, she, it's like, it was like to him, like the greatest blessing in the world. And for, to, to go on these restrictions that people are born with, it's in their blood. You know, I'm thinking of how racist America is. I mean, how many, how many, how long since the slaves have been quote unquote freed? How long since the slaves were brought into this country like property, like chattel? And still they have to deal with so much, so much, so much. And how many people will not, black friends said this, how many white people won't, you know, if they're giving change, they make sure they don't touch touch the hand because in some way they're afraid the black might be catching that it's like some sort of disease it's like can you imagine how you would feel or like some black guy it's like every white woman who sees me starts holding her purse closer it's like imagine holy mother with the caste system that had been in place for how many thousands of years she can't see it just her own child her own child it's just it's so moving and it gives us such a way to look at other people through that lens if we can just try to. But the ego is so strong and we wanna say, but these people are like that. These people are like that. I mean, when when that guy walked in the in in the kitchen, it was like, oh my God, one of those QAnon people, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know this guy, he's got a good heart. He's gotten really deluded. Still back off, back off. Kindly, but firmly. Any other points? Then I will go up and do RT up in the temple. Majji, there are some questions. In yes. There are questions in the chat. Yep. I see. Our I total am? surrender. No, no. Total surrender and using common sense contradictory. 
in a sense? Well, it depends on whether common sense is using the ego. I mean, there's common sense and my will. There's common sense according to my will, and there's common sense according to what, like, the obvious, like, like sun rises in the morning and, and the garbage is going to be taken out on Mondays. Uh, common sense, at, at a point, we had a woman here for lunch today who just recovered from a nasty case of COVID. She said for the first time in her life, she understood what real surrender is. She was like, she was so sick, she didn't know whether she was going to make it. That's like, at that point, it's like, okay, okay, thy will be done, thy will be done. That's what surrender is. At a point where we're still aware, and it takes a fairly, like, when we have that kind of surrender that Girish Gosh had, that's a fairly advanced state that we can have total surrender. Um, Mara Swami Sheshnana talking about that, because for the rest, we still have to use our ethical and moral guidelines. <clears throat> It's like, what is the right thing to do? What is the best thing for this person? What's the best thing for a larger group, for the family, for society, for these individuals? We have to kind of use that as, as a guidepost, Shekhar. And use our common sense about what will be the reaction to this? If I do this, what's the pros? What's the cons? Like, try to use the higher mind for the best idea and then, then go forward. Let's see, how to overcome despair while stabilizing spiritual practices. Despair is, is a difficult one because when we're in deep despair, we don't see a way out. When we're in despair, we're at the bottom of a tunnel and we don't see the light of the tunnel. And it's very hard to convince oneself that there is, that we're in a tunnel, first of all, because otherwise it seems just darkness that there is light there and we will eventually see it. So the first thing we have to recognize is address the fact, identify it. It's like, I am dealing with despair in the mind. It is the mind that is experiencing that. My real nature is not experiencing that. I will take my mind and put it at the feet of the Lord and ask him to kind of like fix it. Mm -hmm. wash it out, deal with it, and then do some practices that cheer you up. I'm a great believer in singing budgets. Doesn't matter whether you can sing well or not, doesn't whether, you know, the neighbors don't like it, sing budgets. Sing to the Lord, think to the Lord, change, go out and go for a walk. Great thing. Go out for a walk, say your mantra while you're saying it. Each step, hear your mantra in the sound of your feet. Hear the mantra in the sign of the leaves. Hear the mantra in the crunch of the ice. Say that. But you have to break the habit. First of all, identify the feeling and then say, ah, I see mine, you're experiencing this. Okay, well, I'm gonna take you out for a minute and I'm gonna put you down at the feet of the Lord and then together we're gonna to go out for a walk. Together, we're gonna to go sing some <laughs> legends. Together, we're gonna to do something and we're gonna read the chandi. We are definitely going to read the Chandi chapter either 4 and 11 or chapter 5 and 12, or you can read the whole dang thing, but definitely going to read the Chandi because that the Divine Mother comes out and she takes those obstacles and whips them aside. Chandi, very powerful. That's my advice. <laughs> okay, anything else here? There is one question from Mitu. Uh, you can go ahead with okay, I don't see one here. Okay, how to overcome. Okay, any can, because I think everything that I'm reading here. Uh, me too, are you able to unmute yourself? She has raised the hand. No, I, actually, it's it me. Yeah. I mean, I, I already asked the question. Oh, okay, okay. Well, me too. Oh, sorry. Now, I'm using my wife's uh, iPad, so it's showing my wife's name. Oh, okay, <laughs> Mr. Me Too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good for the goose is good for the gander. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, then I'll bid you all a good evening. There, I'm gonna there's go one last question. Okay, can you speak it to Mama me? Sushi, there is just one last. 
Yeah. Which book would you suggest on Chandi with symbolic meaning? Ah, uh, David Nelson, David Datakali has a wonderful, big, thick book. Um, let's see if I, I have it in here somewhere, but it has all the symbology. It's big and thick and it's, it's, it's exquisite. Um, if you look under David Nelson or David Datakali and, and uh, Devi Mahatmyam, it will come up in, in uh, Amazon or Vedanta Press. Vedanta Catalog certainly has it, but it's absolutely beautiful. And he, he does very deep analysis and it's, it's so psychologically um, astute. It's right on target. And ev all the meaning, the symbology, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Even the small little Jagannath translation, it's just, it's kind of, you're, it's, you're, it's, it's, it's lovely. But I think, divine mother? Part, um, divine, Is it called divine mother? It's called. Uh, I'm looking online. I find a book named Divine Mother. No, 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 not that one. Um, here, let me see if I can find it. I'm sorry, I'm making you brown. No, 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 I'm just. I have a lot of books. So trying to locate said book is a lot of bookshelves. Come on, David Dutta. We, we have an answer here. Mataji, come In the praise of the goddess? Yes, in praise in of the, the goddess. In the praise of the goddess. Yeah, that's it, that's it, in praise of the goddess. Yes, I found it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Somebody Thank has you. Also, Swami has also mentioned it. It's a fantastic book. It's fantastic. It's really great. Thank uh, you I'm so kinda, much. I, I'm kind of used to the little hokey edition just because that's one we started with with Swami Shesha. And of course, the Sanskrit's powerful too, but how many people really like get gripped by Sanskrit apart from Swami Sarvaprinanda? But, <laughs> but it's, it, I, and the little one is by Jagannath is kind of hokey with your soft sprout like hand is touched, but it's so sweet. It is so sweet. And the David Dutta one is just, it's just knocked down the best one of all. It's just fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. Okay, then, gang, I'm going to have to really go up and do arati in the temple. So, okay, uh, we're sorry to see you go, but hopefully we will see you in person very soon. And that. thank you so much for all this practical help. Thank you, you. Have thank you for the invitation. I'm always happy to see my friends. Always, I'm very <laughs> glad to see Swami Sarva Priyananda after a very long time. <laughs> Diane, thank you for doing all the hard work and our beautiful webmaster who made this happen. Thanks. Yes. It's them. It's the IT guys, believe you me. <laughs> and, and so wonderful to see all of you. I'm so happy. You. Stay well, stay happy, okay? <laughs>